Hello. In this, the latest of our Tank Chats Reloaded series, we're going to look at a vehicle that's been described variously as either an inspired piece of improvisation or a bit of a lash-up. The one behind me, the Sherman Firefly. In Tank Chats Reloaded, we'll be revisiting old favourites from the Tank Chat series and taking a new look at these fighting machines. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. The Firefly is an example of what's called upgunning, taking an existing tank and redesigning it to carry a larger gun. This is and was pretty common practice. Take the T-3476 transformed into the T-3485 or the Centurion which first carries a 17-pounder gun, then a 20-pounder, and finally the L7 105mm gun. The process usually involves some redesign. I mean, in the case of the T-34, a whole new turret. But the Firefly took it to an extreme, shoehorning a much larger gun into a standard turret, not without quite a lot of difficulty. The origins of the Firefly lie in the acceptance into British service of this beast, the US manufactured M4 Sherman. Now as a tank, the Sherman's got lots of advantages. It is reliable, it's easy to crew and to fight, and it's available in quite large numbers. I mean, just under 50,000 were produced, of which 17,000 uh, were supplied to British and Commonwealth forces under the Lend-Lease Agreement. Its gun, the M3 75 mm was also a good tank gun for the first half of the war, able to fire HE, smoke, and an efficient APCBC round. The APCBC, that means armor piercing capped ballistic capped, had a muzzle velocity of 619 meters a second and would penetrate 60 millimeters of rolled homogeneous armor at an angle of 30 degrees at 1,000 meters. The Sherman first saw combat at the Second Battle of El Alamein in October 1942, and it was a considerable success. The 75mm gun was well able to take care of the Panzer III's and IVs, but made up around half the enemy armour. By 1943, Tiger is still very rarely encountered, and Panther obviously never, uh, but German armour is improving. Now this is Panzer IV Asforum D, and as you can see, this has got upgraded frontal armour, but when the Asforung G comes out, that's got 80 mil frontal armour protection, and that means the M3 gun is becoming very rapidly outclassed. With the arrival of a small number of Tiger Wands in Tunisia, a certain panic set in, and the solution was the British Royal Ordnance 17-pounder towed anti-tank gun. Uh, now, in order to get those weapons into the field quickly, a number were mounted on 25-pounder field gun trails. That's total improvisation. Uh, and that configuration was known as the pheasant. An APDS round fired from a 17-pounder had a muzzle velocity of 1,204 metres a second. And it would penetrate 233 millimetres of armour at 1,000 metres. Even the APCBC would penetrate 150 mil at the same distance compared to the 60 millimetres of the M3 75mm. It was time to hunt Tiger. Bearing in mind the inherent weaknesses, lack of mobility and crew protection, of towed anti-tank guns, the next step was to find a way of putting a 17-pounder on a tank. The project to mount a 17-pounder on a Cromwell chassis with a tall, rather ungainly turret, the A30 Challenger, was underway. This was encountering major problems but with the assistance of the director of the Royal Armoured Corps, General Raymond Briggs, two officers at Lulworth at the School of Gunnery, Lieutenant Colonel Witheridge and Major Brighty, were working on a rival scheme, shoehorning a 17-pounder anti-tank gun into a Sherman turret. This really wasn't easy. The 17-pounder is a much bigger gun than the M3 75mm. The breech had to be redesigned, so the breech block now opens to the side rather vertically and they needed a new recoil system as well. 
Uh, on the towed 17 pounder anti tank gun, the recoil was almost a meter, and that's far too much for inside a tank turret. So they came up with a new recoil system, which is based on the six pounder anti tank gun. The other big change is an extra hatch for the loader. A normal Sherman, he'd get in through the commander's hatch, work his way round behind the gun. But this takes up so much space, it's not possible to do that. To make room for the number 19 radio set, a hole was cut in the back of the turret and a box, a bustle, was welded on to house it. Ammunition stowage was such a problem that the crew had to be reduced from five to four. Uh, they lost the bow machine gunner in favour of the storage for 14 more rounds. Even so, capacity was reduced from 90 rounds of 75 mil to 75 17 pounder rounds on the Sherman 1C and from 97 to 78 on the VC Firefly. Problems aside, the Lulworth trials were seen as successful. The best way to get the 17 pounder into a tank before, most importantly, D Day. The Challenger project was abandoned when only about 200 had been built and 3,413. 17 pounder gun kits were ordered in batches from the Royal Ordnance Factories in Cardiff and Leeds. About 2,100 to 2,200, we're not quite sure of the exact number, fireflies would later be converted. Not every Sherman could be converted to a firefly. It had to have a petrol engine, the M34A1 mantlet rather than the earlier M34, and the turret traverse mechanism had to come from oil gear rather than Westinghouse or Logan Sport. Fireflies were converted from a mixture of Sherman 5s, the M4A4, and Sherman 1s, both the standard welded M4 and the M4 composite with a cast front hull section. Conversions began in January 1944, but there was always a shortage of suitable Shermans, especially towards the end of 1944, after the Americans stopped production of 75mm armed tanks. Such was the need that some fireflies were apparently converted from partial brew-ups, battlefield recoveries and reconditioned Shermans. Our Sherman is a 5C, so it's a converted Sherman 5, and it's got the A57 multibank petrol engine. It was built by Chrysler in June 1943. It was almost certainly a training tank. We don't think it left the UK but it's been badged up as a tank of guards armoured. In fact, it's representing Sergeant Robinson's tank, 2nd Grenadier Guards, which was the first tank to cross the Nibingen Ridge over the River Wall in the Market Garden operation in 1944. If you look at the tank itself, you can see some of the features that sort of mark it out as a Sherman Firefly. To begin with, the position for the bow machine gun has been welded up and closed with an armoured plug. And then, moving on round, if we go and have a look at the side of the turret, there is a pistol port. That's just there, and that has again been welded and closed off. Um, although, looking at it, it doesn't actually seem to have a functional hinge, so it may never have been an operational feature. We then have the gun crutch. That's this fitting on the back deck. Um, that is absolutely vital. You need to be able to lock the gun in position in transit. If uh, a gun of that length thrashes around, uh, then it's gonna damage its mounts. It's gonna destroy the accuracy of the weapon. And then finally, and this isn't just a, a firefly thing, uh, but it's a rather sort of odd feature of a lot of British tanks. Down there, that is the electronically operated smoke candle. By all accounts, that wasn't very effective in generating a smoke screen. Okay, time to get inside. As you'll see, this vehicle is very complete. Just about everything is there, right the way down to a very thick layer of protective grease that was applied when she was put into storage decades ago. There are two turret hatches. Over on the left-hand side is the loader's hatch, and this one is the commander's hatch. This cupola is traversable and there is a fitting for an M6 uh, periscope, but most tank commanders tended to habitually have the hatch open 
and head and shoulders out because situational awareness in combat is absolutely vital. Here we have the breach of the gun. Now, this isn't a very big turret to start with, and you can see this takes up a lot of space. It practically cuts the thing in two. Uh, on top, two of the recoil cylinders, and this is the breach, and that opens. Uh, it had to be changed, in fact, from the 17-pounder anti-tank gun. That had a vertically opening breach. This one opens horizontally. It's also semi-automatic, so that when a round is fired, the gun recoils, the breach opens automatically, ejects the spent brass, and you're ready for the next round. I'm sitting in the gunner's position. Um, he's got a periscope here. The telescopic gun sight, unfortunately, is missing. And his controls down here. Uh, left hand is the manual elevation wheel. And in my right hand is the control for the hydraulic turret traverse. Ammunition stowage is split between six bins on the left and right of the loader, actually under the turret floor, and then down uh, in the former co-driver's position down at the front. Looking at the loader's position here, you've got his periscope. Uh, there is a coaxial 30 caliber machine gun, and then a bracket for a two inch bomb thrower. And that could be used to generate a local smoke screen if it was needed. You can see it is very cramped in this space. And the 17 pounder is a big, big, heavy round. So just the physical effort required to maneuver those rounds into the breach would be absolutely enormous. You would need a loader who is very muscular indeed. Just firing the 17 pounder gun was a pretty arduous proposition for the crew because it generated a huge blast, a big flash, and it's very, very loud. So the procedure, um, as it was stated in the manual, is that the tank commander would give the command three, two, one, fire, and that would give the crew time to open their mouths, close their eyes, and clamp their earphones uh, onto their ears. Failure to do that would leave you temporarily deaf and blinded, uh, and that is not a good position to be in in combat. Additionally, the gun itself uh, generated a huge blast outside. It would chuck up a cloud of dust. It would potentially set fire to dry vegetation, um, and that could potentially compromise the position of the tank. Such was the hurry to get fireflies onto the battlefield, that quite a lot of the gunners hadn't had that much opportunity to train. Um, Joe Eakins, uh, who was a trooper in the Northamptonshire Yeomanry, he was a firefly gunner, he was about to distinguish himself in a particular action outside Connell. But he reported that he'd only actually fired five practice rounds on the range before deploying to France. In spite of this, the firefly was to prove an outstanding success. We're not entirely sure of the figures, but around about 2,100 to 2,200 Shermans were converted to fireflies. About a thousand of these were supplied to 21st Army Group in Northwest Europe and 225 to 15th Army in Italy. In principle, each Sherman troop would comprise three standard Shermans and one firefly, although some units did try to form troops of four fireflies. From the start in the Normandy Bocage fighting following D-Day, the fireflies demonstrated their superior hitting power. On June the 9th, 1944, a Canadian firefly commanded by Lieutenant G.K. Henry accounted for five Panthers from 12th SS Panzer Division, with other Shermans claiming two more, thus repelling an attack on the village of Norrie and Bessin. Five days later, a 4th 7th Dragoon Guards firefly commanded by Sergeant Wilfred Harris knocked out five more near tilly sur -Sul. I can't, of course, fail to mention, uh, bearing in mind the fact that I, amongst other people in this museum, knew him quite well, the feat of Trooper Joe Eakins, A Squadron, 1st North Ants Yeomanry, who on the 8th of August 1944, near Sintho, destroyed three Tigers uh, in 12 minutes with five rounds. One of those was the command tank of Hauptsturmführer Michael Wittmann. This isn't to say that uh, the Fireflies had it all their own way. 
uh, any Sherman, Fireflies included, are uh, under-armoured when facing up to tanks like the Tiger or the Panther. And it was a saying in the British Army that if you sent a troop of Shermans, including a Firefly, up against a Tiger, you'd be lucky if one out of four came home. There were never enough Fireflies to meet demand, although they were never intended to fully replace the 75mm armed Sherman. Its HE round had higher performance than the 17-pounders, so against softer targets, which were the majority of what a tank could expect to fire on, it was extremely useful. The long barrel of the Firefly's 17-pounder also made it an obvious target. To get around this, the end of the barrel was often painted in light colours, with, on occasion, a false muzzle break halfway along. Finally, I think it would be good to hear from a real Firefly veteran. Back in 2015, my colleague Stuart Wheeler recorded an interview with Ken Dowding, ex-1420th Hussars, uh, about his experiences in Firefly in Italy, and also includes his account of knocking out a Tiger tank. And how did you find the um, handling of the Firefly? How did it? How did well, you find the tank? Well, it, it was to us. It was a tank, and it was a gun, and everything. Our uh, was to fight. Uh, our, we went in there solely to fight the Germans. Did you know about the Tigers being in the vicinity? Did you know there were no. The Tigers there? No, not until after. But this is. But I was always aware that, that as I told you, that when we were we were moving, we were ready. Always, if we were going into to action, we checked checked everything in this, the possibilities, the probabilities, all these sort of things. And one of the things, of course, was crew. Are they right? Are they right? Do they understand? Do they understand? I came in on, on the right flank, and I had the shock of my life. There was this bloody great big tank. But the thing is, I was fully prepared, and I immediately, you know, gave, you know, gunnery orders, bang, and he was hit. Always, my gunner was trained, foot on the pedal, you fire, that's it. No about sizing up and, you know, playing soldiers, you just hit. And did the, did the Tiger crew get out? Or no. They, they, they were killed no, they, 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 the next day, a, a friend of mine, a, a sergeant, we had a, a look what, uh, it wasn't so badly down, but it was old, of course. And um, when you were engaging the Tiger, did yes. you use armour-piercing, discarding sabot rounds? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, no bother, as I said, my instructions were fire, shoot the bastard, you know, and that's it. And that's it, what they did. And in any case, I was prepared for it. I knew when I got round, when I saw that, I knew what was going to happen. Because we already, you know, in our minds, we, we, were, we were loaded and we were looking for something like that. And, and did you find when you fired the gun on the Firefly that, that you got a lot of smoke coming out of the barrel or was it, was it hard to see? To Obviously, the... banging, you know, terrific noise and, uh, and that was it. And what's it like being inside the turret when you fire? Is it, is that, because that gun is so big? Yeah, well, the thing is that uh, that gun at the time, you know, was a, a, um, one of the things was the backfire on there or the, you know, the was 11 and three quarter inches recoil. So we knew all these things, but they were all new things in those days, you know, like the, uh, with the recoil and everything. But we, as a, as a troop, were well aware. How did you find um, using tanks in a built up area? Did you have to use the infantry with you? Were they trained with you? The, we, in the built up area, we mostly had Gurkhas with us. Yes, they were trained with us. Were the, what were the, the worst dangers? Was it people firing from above? Exactly. If we were going down there and we saw the slightest thing, we just hit it. I mean, we didn't, you know, bother to go down and check, is he all right, is he all right? The thing is, see it and shoot it. Any, any problem we had, we took down all premises, you know, with gunfire. Not anything, anything that looked, looked like a window out or out, shoot the bastard, finish. Clear it. After 
actions? Did you have debriefings? No. No, not proper debriefings. We were just told, you know, in the, like, amongst ourselves, right, good show, lad, and that, uh, now let's get on with it. In conclusion, I think we can probably say the Firefly was really a, a piece of inspired innovation. Later Shermans, of course, fitted with the 76mm gun that did level the playing field a little bit against enemy armour. And, of course, they were uh, more comfortable, um, more ergonomic, shall we say, to crew than the Firefly. But I think the accolade for the Firefly is that it served all the way through the war and post-war with the Dutch, Argentinian and a number of other armies. And I think probably the final um, sort of accolade is that the Lebanese army kept their fireflies in service right through to the 1980s. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks for watching. And if you did, please subscribe. And if you can, support us on Patreon.